Let's pray. Father, we thank and praise you, Lord, for your grace towards us. We thank you, God, that you will continue to work in our hearts and in our minds, even as we look at your word. God, we're asking for transformation to take place. Transformation to take place in our hearts, in our minds, O oh God. Renew our minds, O oh God. Help us to understand more of who you are today, our almighty God, the one who created everything that we see. So, Father, I pray, God, that you would speak to us. I pray, Lord Jesus, that your word will come alive off of the pages of the word so that we can apply it to our lives and do the things that you've called us to do, to live the way that you want us to live, O oh God. So bless this time, we pray. Speak to us directly, O oh God, and help us to know more of who you are. In Jesus' name, amen. Have you ever felt like nothing seems to be working right for you? Like nothing seems to be working right. You try and you try and it's just like there's nothing that seems to be going right. And if something does go right, then you think, well, surely it shouldn't have because nothing's supposed to go right. It's like the boy who was trying to learn math. And the teacher said to him, to the little boy, Okay, well, let me try and help you with this illustration. He says, because he was having so much trouble with meth, he says to him, okay, well, think about this. If you reach into your right pocket and you take out $20 and you reach into your left pocket and you take out $20, what do you have? And the boy said, somebody else's pence. <laughs> Why? Because nothing ever, I'm never going to find $20 in my pocket. You might feel like the little boy. There's nothing that seems to work out right. Everything that I do seems to go wrong. The moment you take one step forward, it's like you're taking two steps back. And this is why it's so important for us to know the names of God. Because a name matters. A name matters. In fact, a name includes identity and understanding of the person just by mentioning the name. If that's true with people, for example, who's this? What comes to mind when you hear of Bill Gates, anybody? Microsoft, money, some of you, some other things, but billionaire, yes, right? So Bill Gates, you think of money. You think of Microsoft. Serena Williams, what do you think of? Tennis. The name is branded to the person, all right? What about Tiger Woods? You think of golf, most people? You think of golf. Or Lionel Messi, you think of football. So different people's names brings about a reaction based on the identity, based on what they do. Now, if this is true with people, how much more important is it with God? Yet as believers, what we need to do is understand the names of God so we can know who it is that we worship just now. So we can know who it is that we serve because your understanding of who he is determines how you're going to live. Today, the first name we're going to learn for this week is Elohim. Everyone say Elohim. Elohim is the introductory name of God. If you were to meet him for the first time in the Bible, he introduces himself as Elohim. So the question, therefore, has to be, and this is even in Bible interpretation, what's called the law of first mention. is when, when is something is first mentioned in the word of God, there's some great significance to it. So God decided to introduce himself with this particular name in order for us to understand who he is. That name is what? Elohim. Everyone say it again. Elohim, it's a beautiful name. This is a name where God's going to help us to understand really who he is today. Elohim. It's first of all found in Genesis chapter 1 verse 1 where it says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Usually in our English Bibles, the word Elohim, which is a Hebrew word, is translated as God. Capital G-O-D. In the context, we know this is talking about the Lord. In the beginning, God did what? He created the heavens and the earth. So the Bible tells us that at the very beginning, 
at the beginning of, not of his existence, but at the beginning of time as we know it, God created the heavens and the earth. That means that stuff was going on in eternity past. This is the crazy thing about it. Stuff was going on in eternity past, and God existed in eternity past. God never had a beginning. Think about the reality of that. He never had a start. He never had a conception. God never had a beginning. God always existed. And so when the Bible says in the beginning, it means when God decided to create time as we know it, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Profound. I think about the fact that we as his people, in my mind, can keep the Lord pretty busy. So what was he doing in eternity past? He decided to create us knowing what, we, knowing what we're like, knowing how stubborn we could be, knowing how much we weren't going to trust him and depend on him. That is love and that is grace, wouldn't you say, to create us in spite of? But in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, notice what the word of God says. God created. From this verse and these first few verses in the book of Genesis, we can discover some attributes about who God is that you serve, who the God is that belongs to you, who your father is. It's a good thing to know who daddy is, especially if you're his children, because your understanding of who he is will determine everything else in life. It says this, that in the beginning, God, the one who is Elohim, created the heavens and the earth. There are seven attributes of God even in these first few verses first of all we know that God is creator everyone say God is creator he's the one who created us we weren't here by chance this wasn't just a big bang that sort of happened and things sort of worked out together you could blow up whatever it's going to get worse it's not going to come together that's just natural right you take anything and you blow it up and it becomes a mess the last time I checked it doesn't come together in the form of order and detail organization that doesn't take place so therefore we know that God is the one who created everything in the beginning the Bible says which helps us to realize that if God was the one who created something in the beginning then God has to be outside of the beginning because he's the one who started it no one can start something unless they're already there isn't that true? You can't start running unless you have legs and you're actually living to run. You can't start a project unless you're there to start the project. So if God is the one who was in the beginning who created, then obviously God has to be outside of time. He lived in eternity past, which means that secondly, God is not only creator, but secondly, God is transcendent. Transcendent means to be outside of time. So if you're outside of time, you can be in the past and the present and the future as we know it at the same time because you're God. There's no one like him. Do I have an amen? There's nobody like your daddy. Your daddy is the creator. He's the one who created the heavens and the earth. But secondly, he is also transcendent, which means that he is outside of time. The Bible goes on and tells us in the Hebrews by faith. Not blind faith, by logical faith we understand that the universe was formed at God's command so that what is seen was made not, was not made of what was visible. That's deep. That means God created stuff without having anything. He didn't have anything to begin with when he created. He created the Hebrew word for this is ex nihilo. It means out, ex, like exit. Nihilo means nothing. Out of nothing, God created everything. He created it out of nothing. Now, for us to create stuff, like if you're going to bake a cake and create a cake, you need flour, you need eggs, you need baking soda or, or baking powder. You need other things to be added to the cake in order to make it something. Am I right? If you're going to make pancakes, I learned how to make some pistachio rose pancakes. 
rose extract with pistachio and you break it all up. I got inspired from this bakery when I saw these rose pistachio cakes. And I said, let me try that in pancakes. It's amazing. I asked my wife. It's amazing. So and then you have that with some nice warm syrup on top and whipped cream sort of takes away from it. You don't need whipped cream. It tastes so good. You know what I mean? Whipped cream is only needed if it's pancake. don't taste so sharp. But let me tell you, when you put that together, but I need, I can't make, I can't just create pistachio out of like, boom, here's, I have to go to the grocery store based on somebody who grew it in order to harvest it, in order for me to get it and to bring it home and to crush it. God created out of nothing. That's how awesome your daddy is. By faith, we understand that the universe was formed by, at God's command, his word, so that what is seen was not made of what was visible. That's deep. That means God is able to create things that don't even exist. If you got something going on in your life and you say, well, it's just not there, that's okay. God's used to creating something out of nothing. He's used to making something out of nothing. He's used to making someone out of no one because that's what God is like. That means that he is self-sufficient. He doesn't need any other resources in order for him to be and to operate and to do the things that he needs to do. He needs absolutely nothing because that's how awesome he is. God is creator. He is transcendent. He is self-sufficient. And then we have this major deception from the enemy, which is called evolution, which says that you evolved from a monkey. Before the monkey, amen, amen. Before the monkey, there was a blob, okay? And the blob sort of just started moving and just came alive somehow. And then it eventually started swimming. And then it went from swimming to, you know, flopping on the land. And eventually it could move around a little bit. Then it grew some legs. And then it became a monkey. And then, it, you know, if that were the case, then why aren't we still evolving? Why can't you see evidence of this? But when you com com compare an ant to a hippopotamus or a snake to a lion or a whale to a human being, you're going to tell me that that stuff all evolved on its own? And so this is what evolutionists will tell you. Therefore, if you believe the evolutionist theory, you have to therefore believe that it takes millions and millions and millions of years in order to get to the point of where we are today. The reality, brothers and sisters, is simply this. Time doesn't have the power to create. Time doesn't create anything. If anything with time, things deteriorate. They don't get, they don't actually become something. You know what I mean? Like I said before, you have a bike and it rusts out. Or you have clothes and the moth comes and eats them or mildew takes them over in this country real fast. So all of these things, with time, things don't get better. With time, things decrease. So therefore, time creates nothing. So you can put millions and millions of years on it as much as you want. It's not going to make any difference because time doesn't create anything. Evolutionists basically believe that nobody created everybody with nothing. I mean, that will make a monkey out of you, right? If you believe that nonsense. You know what the day is? The atheist holiday? April 1st, April Fool's Day. The Bible says that the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. You could just look at creation and it proves that God exists. But even for an unbeliever that doesn't believe in Jesus Christ, they still have to believe that there has to be intelligent design behind what it is that we see and what we experience there's a sign that Sean you wouldn't mind getting that sign for me there's a sign it's a very simple sign it's not even that artistic it's not like a masterpiece it's a piece of graphic art this sign that Sean is about to get says something that we need to do in our lives are you ready in regards to this series What does it say? It's time to start. Start what? Application, applying the word of God. Now, this is a sign that I can show you this simple sign. It's not very artistic. But you would, no one in the room would say, this sign just came about by a bang. 
This came about by boom, explosion, and the A just dropped in place. The A was formed, boom, 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 and all this happened. This is nothing. On the scale of 100, this is less than 1% of the complexity that's in your human body and the things that are going on right now in your body. There are so many cycles and symptoms that are going on in your body right now in regards to your heart, your kidneys are working, your lungs, the gases exchange that's taking place with oxygen and carbon dioxide and all of these things that are taking place in your human body, millions of things that are going on, Everyone's, everything's working together. The reason why is because you're still alive today. And so therefore, no one's going to say, well, that just happened by chance. But you know what happened? We as human beings, we like to be our own boss. We don't like to be accountable to nobody. And so therefore, we came up with this concept known as evolution. Evolution in the crux of it was a, was a hypothesis. It wasn't proven. It was Darwin, Charles Darwin, who made it popular. But he was the one who wrote letters to someone that he admired by the name of Asa Gray. And when you read his letters, I've read some of them, he will continue to say, it's my hypothesis, it's my speculation, it's my assumption, when he came up with this whole concept of the survival of the fittest. And if you truly believe in an evolutionist theory, then you also have to believe in the gang mentality. The gang mentality is you get rid of the weak, but you keep the strong. It's the same thing in regards to evolution. And we wonder why we have issues with gangs today. And we wonder why we have issues with people that can, can, can uh, stab other people in the back and care less about them. It's the survival of the fittest. The strong survive. The weak you get rid of. You wonder why abortion is such a topic today when it shouldn't be because that's God's creation. In other words, persons would say, well, but a woman would say, especially those that are, believe in ab uh, abortion, would say, well, it's my, the right to my body. But if we believe in the sacred God who creates life, then you have to say, well, the body that's inside of you is not yours. The body inside is another human being. That body has its own worth based on God says I was miraculously put together in the womb, Psalms 139. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. The creation that's taking place is on the inside. It's a gift from God. But if you believe in the survival of the fittest, the weak, the strong can always destroy the weak. And so this whole concept of evolution, again, is something that goes completely against the word of God. Because your God is creator. So this is the bottom line. If we can get rid of God, then we can get rid of absolutes. That means right and wrong. And if we can get rid of right and wrong, then I as a human being become the judge to determine whether or not what's right and what's wrong. And if I become my own judge, then therefore I don't have to be accountable to God. That's where the world is right now. So get rid of the Lord then we don't have to be accountable to him, then we can do whatever we want. That's evolution. Creationism says that, listen, there is a God who created us and who's sustaining the universe as it is right now, so we better pay attention and find out what he says about life because he must know more than we know because he was the one who created us because he lives outside of time and he is self-sufficient and he's the one who's able to come and do whatever he wants. And if he's the one that's able to sustain life, he's the one that's able to judge us as well as to whether or not we're living up to his standard. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the spirit of God was hovering over the waters. The earth was formless. The earth was empty. The word in this formless uh, idea is almost the word which means chaotic. So God has to come and bring order to chaos. It says that darkness was over the surface of the deep because we know that there's one by the name of the devil, Satan, was cast down to the earth. So the earth became God, the earth became Satan's death row, the place where he will be held until he gets thrown into the lake of fire where he can mess around in regards to the earth. The earth is his death row even before God said, let there be light. And if 
darkness was over the surface of the deep, which symbolizes evil, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. That means God's Spirit decides, I'm going to do something. We can't help but come to the reality that God that you serve is intentional. This wasn't a mistake. All wrapped up in this word Elohim as creator in the first few verses of the Bible is helping us to realize that he is creator. He is transcendent. He is outside of time. He is self-sufficient because he created something out of nothing. He's intentional because he has a plan. And God said, let there be light and what? And there was light. Let's say that again. And God said what? And what? One more time. And God said, and what? So God spoke it into existence. That's how powerful he is, that all he has to do is speak and things can take place. All God has to do is speak a word and things can actually happen. God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good. That means he felt something and said, mm, 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 that's, some, that's good stuff. The, and he separated light from darkness. So if God is the one who is so great and so awesome and all he's got to do is speak, and when he speaks, stuff happens, when you say he is my God, that means Elohim, that means all of this stuff is all associated with it, that all God has to do is speak to a situation. Now what's important to realize is the light in verse 3 on the first day of creation is not the sun, is not the moon, it's not the stars because that's not created, I think, later on until day four. So that means this must be the power, the glory of God. When God decides to shine down on earth and says, bing, just devil, you thought you won and you thought you were in control because you're down there with the other angels and this, that, and the other. But let me just, boom, God shows up. Can you imagine how bright that was for the devil? When God turns on his glory, when God turns on the fact that he's glorious and he's about to do something great, surely he must have been intimidated. Surely he must have been shaking to say, what is he up to now? God is intentional. This is no mistake. The fact that he is Elohim, which means that he is great. God saw that the light was good. He admires himself and he separated the light from the darkness, which tells us something else. His glory is far more powerful than evil. Because light cannot stand up to darkness. Is that true? Can I give you an illustration? Light cannot stand up to darkness. When you turn all the lights off, you're in darkness. Isn't that a big difference than where we were just now? So the reality is that this is what the earth was like. It was full of darkness. And then God comes along and says, I have a plan. And God decides to turn on the lights of his glory. Because God's more powerful than darkness. Good is more powerful than evil. That's why he says, do not be overcome evil with evil, but overcome evil with good. Because when God came on the scenes, God turned on the lights. There's a big difference when the lights are on and when the lights are off. Even though to God, the lights could be off and he could see through it. So be careful what you do in the dark. But the reality is that God is light. His glory is being shown as to be the one who is great, which means that the one that you serve is also light. He is all powerful. He is glorious. He is glorious. The God that you serve is glorious, this Elohim. And God called the light day and the darkness he called night. And there was evening and there was morning. The what? The first day. Let me tell you. There's been a whole lot of debate in recent years. I'll probably say in the last 50 years in regards to this word day and there are theologians that will do their best to prove that this is not a 24-hour day this actually is symbolizing millions of years so when God created the world it took him millions of years in order to do it I think that's crazy because I think if the Bible says a day if there was morning then I mean it's almost like it's helping us realize that in the future there are going to be people that are going to say this is millions of years so let me just make sure I add that make sure that's in there and there was evening and there was morning the first day just to help us to understand that it's a 24-hour period do I have an amen 
Where are the people that believe that God created the heavens and the earth in six days? They are becoming fewer and fewer, by the way, even in evangelical circles. Theologians that will teach this in Bible school that it took millions of years. Why? Because they don't want to look like they're crazy among the world who's fully accepted in evolution. I say, if God said he did it by just speaking it, then his God. Do I have an amen? Amen, and there's more light. Praise the Lord. <laughs> yes. Amazing how you can get used to darkness too, huh? That should have been on all this time. God's called the light day, and the darkness he called night, and there was evening, and there was morning the first day. And God created that and just, bam, just did it. I speak it, and it happens. Now, that also means that God has to be miraculous. If you could speak something into existence and make it happen immediately, that's a miracle that's God that's the God that you serve when it says in the beginning God that word Elohim encompasses this because God wants to present himself as the creator as the one who sustains as the one who is the judge right from the beginning and God also is a person there are many people who would say he is the force that's out there it's like Return of the Jedi talk. Here's the made of force be with you. It's like that you have some force. God is not a force. It's a person. God is a person. He thinks because in order for him to speak, he has to have a mind. He thinks. He speaks things into existence. He has the power to create. He acts. He even feels. How does he feel? He says, that's good. Oh, that's very good. Oh, that's awesome imagine somebody doing something and you look back at it some of you guys are like this right ladies you look back and you bake a cake whatever you may do or clean a room whatever that looks good and you know you did it nobody else did it but you you're admiring your work God admired his work and says this was good the idea is this is perfect this is very good this is awesome this is better than awesome look at what I have done so God has feelings because God is a person now, as we continue to unpack this, the God who you serve is cr a creator. He is transcendent. He is self-sufficient. His intentional, his light, his miraculous, and his a person. All that's found in the first few verses of Genesis chapter 1. When you say the word Elohim, God. Now, if we look a little bit more carefully at the word, Elohim is a Hebrew word which denotes God, that's the translation for the Hebrew word Elohim in our English Bibles. It's God. The word is Elohim. And Elohim is the infinite, all-powerful God who shows by his works that he is creator. Not only creator, because there are some people that will believe that God started it all and then he left it. And no longer sort of exist. But there was a God who started it all and is no longer involved. No, he is the sustainer of it as well. In fact, the Bible tells us in the book of Colossians that everything that you see has been created by Jesus Christ. And there's nothing that is seen that wasn't created by him, things in heaven and, and on the earth. And then it goes on to say this at the end of the passage, and he holds it all together. People wonder, as they study the scientists, as they study the atom, and the nucleus of the atom and everything else associated with this, they can't understand how it gets held together. Like what's holding it together? The answer is Jesus Christ. So in order for the world to be destroyed by fire in the future, as the word of God says, all Jesus has to do is let go and it will burn up. God holds everything together. God holds everything together. He is sustainer, and therefore, because he is creator and sustainer, he is the supreme judge of the world. Not Oprah, not Dr. Phil, not everybody else you can think of on the Today Show. Is God's going to have the final say. God's going to have the last answer. Elohim occurs 2,500 times. 35 times alone in Genesis chapter 1 to the beginning of Genesis chapter 2 up to verse 4. 35 times he's introducing himself saying, Elohim, 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 this is who I am. This is who I, what I have done. Understand who I am so that you can have a better understanding of who you, you can have faith in. 
And El simply means strong one. And when you add Ohim, Ohim puts it in its plurality sense. It makes it plural. So the strong one, which the word Elohim occurs in plural form. In plural form. For example, so God created mankind. This is verse 27, I believe. So God, 26, 27. So God created mankind in his own image as a representation. In the image of God, God created them. Male and female, he created them. You see that? In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. So God created mankind in his own image. So God is the one who says earlier, let us make man. So who's the us? I thought God was one. So why is God saying let us? The plurality that's used in the Bible in the form of the name Elohim is to help you to understand how majestic he is by placing it in the form of plurality. Also, it helps us to realize that God is triune as well. If I can have that big there, please. Thank you very much. My children love pretzels. Anybody want some? <laughs> In the back, we'll get you some. I don't know who came up with a pretzel, but a pretzel is a great illustration for the plurality of God. You have a pretzel here. There's a hole here, a hole there, and a hole there. Three holes that form the pretzel. And the idea is this hole is not that hole, and that hole is not this hole, and this hole is not that hole, and this hole isn't this hole. They're each separate. You have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. There is one God. So the misunderstanding, as Jehovah's Witness would say, they think that we believe that there are three gods because we're saying believing in the triune God. And the reason why we believe in a triune God is because he represents himself in three persons, but each of those persons are God. So by themselves, if you take out, break off a piece of the pretzel and you have just one of those holes, it's still called pretzel. God is still God, but God coexists in three persons, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. In important times in the Bible, all three of them show up. Like when Jesus Christ is there and he identifies with his own message, when he gets baptized, you have the voice from heaven, which is the Father. You have the Spirit in the form of the dove, and you have the Son that is right there being baptized, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The book of Colossians tells us that God was, Jesus Christ was there when God created the heavens and the earth in Genesis 1.1. In fact, it says Jesus Christ is creator. So how can Jesus Christ be creator if he just came during the time period of marriage? He had to be eternal, just like the Father's eternal. So the Father, the Son, and the Spirit of eternal, they coexist in three persons. Each one is not the other, but yet individually they're God, but there's only one. Deuteronomy tells us, for the Lord, our God is one God. You think about that long enough, it will hurt your head. Because that's how awesome God is. And I wonder this. I wonder if part of being with the Lord and the reason why we're going to live for eternity is to get to know God more and more. To get to know more of who he is. Because it says that when we see him, we shall be like him. But that doesn't necessarily, that's talking in regards to the essence of our makeup and our sinless state. But it doesn't mean that we're not going to be ever learning because to learn isn't sinful. Adam and Eve, in their perfect condition, before the sin was ever introduced, had to name the animals and learn their names and to present them. And he was learning as he was going along. So maybe in eternity, the awesome thing about being in eternity is to get to know God more and more and more because he's that deep. It takes eternity to get to understand him. It takes eternity to get to know him, to appreciate him even more. So there may be an ever-growing uh, knowledge that's taking place in heaven because only God is perfect in his knowledge. And so when we die and go to heaven, we're not going to be God. So chances are we're going to be ever learning, unpacking, 
as to who he is, this awesome God. So it occurs in plural form, and Elohim means strong, mighty creator. Strong creator or strong, mighty creator. That's the word Elohim. So say it again, Elohim. So this God who created the heavens and the earth, this is just our, this is our home, by the way. This is the galaxy. This is our house, our home. Earth is there, not even in the center of our own galaxy, but Earth is there in the whole solar system. There's a little speck inside of this big thing called the Milky Way. And then they discovered that there are millions and millions and millions of these galaxies, billions, in fact, of galaxies just like this, not necessarily with whatever type of life on it. They haven't discovered that, but just we're the ones that seem to be the only ones that have life. But you see, this is the galaxy. Now, when God said, let there be light, and that light came on the earth, it had to travel at the speed of light. Then later on, we discover light, right? And we notice that we can house light and we could put it in fiber optics and all of this type of stuff. So what we've done is we've perfected internet and fiber optics and, you know, so therefore that's traveling almost at the speed of light. They're near the speed of light. It's just a bit short, but it's near the speed of light. So that's why you can send a WhatsApp here, and um, I can send a WhatsApp here to the guys in the back from Taiwan, and they get it in almost real time because it's traveling at the speed of light. You got me? That means that if Digicel and One Communications got together, and so, so let's um, set up so we can get a message from one end of the Milky Way to the other end of the Milky Way with fiber optics and with the speed of light. As quickly, immediately as it gets from halfway around, literally halfway around the world, which is Taiwan to here, there's 12 hours difference to get here. So if we can do that and boom, and you get it immediately, in order for us to, if they sent, if I sent a WhatsApp and I was here and I sent it to the guys in the back and their booth is right here. It will take over 100,000 years for them to get the message to go to show you how big it is. You mean to tell me that God can create all of this in his vastness, vast array, but he can't take care of your life? You mean to tell me that he can do all of this and he can care less about you? You mean to tell me that God can be this great and yet you he, he, he can care less about you. Can he not manage your life? Is it managing all this? Look what Job says. God stretched the northern sky over empty space and hangs the earth on nothing. You know how heavy the earth is? And it's just hanging on nothing. How awesome is God? Sometimes we forget that God is so great and so mighty, and we start to look at our problems as being greater than the Lord. Don't make a mountain out of a molehill. Put the problem in his rightful place by putting God in his rightful place. Once you put God in his rightful place, all of our problems get in their place. How many say amen? Isn't that true? Come on, let's put our hands together and praise God for that. That's a blessing. So in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And then at the end of these days of creation, he creates animals and he creates all of these things. That's Elohim, the creator. He created all of these things out of nothing. The trees and everything. And this is what's so awesome about the Lord is God did something. Some would say, uh, creationists would say that the earth, that not necessarily the earth itself because the earth was formless and void before God said, let there be light. So we don't know how long the beginning is from the time period in which God said, let there be light. But once he started that let there be light stuff, it was 24-hour days. God created all these things that we see today, right? And you notice what's so amazing about the Lord it's within each and everything that he created, he put in procreation with inside of it so that they can continue to create. Isn't that amazing? That's deep. That means that the carrot that you eat or the broccoli or whatever it is that you had, it was like God was the one who created it originally and allowed it to reproduce itself. Everything was created, the Bible says, after its kind. That's deep. So if you had chicken in the last week, that means that that chicken didn't just, you know, come from nowhere. God created it a long time ago. 
Isn't that amazing? So God not only created stuff, but he sustains it. We are people. We're here. God didn't create us out of the dust of the earth. He did that with Adam. And then allow this stuff to take place called reproduction. Isn't it amazing as to how God is? That he not only sustains stuff, but he keeps it going. So the Lord blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. So the word rested simply means that God was done. God rested not because he was tired. God rested because he was finished. He says, I'm done now. I could take my break because I'm just, I'm just going to enjoy the stuff that I just created and take a break. And the idea is that God is so great and so mighty that he spoke these things. into. How tired can he be if he spoke it? He spoke these things into existence to show forth that he is God. And the God you serve doesn't get tired. I remember Sister Bonit Afriani. She was a missionary from Haiti. And she was praying to God. Pastor Simbler called her up one time at Brooklyn Tabernacle to pray. And one of the things she thanked God for is, God, we want to thank you today because you, in her French accent, because you have no pajamas. <laughs> Isn't that deep? God don't earn pajamas because he doesn't sleep. He doesn't get tired. God is ever looking, ever working, ever moving, always working on your behalf, doing things by his power and by his grace. So in conclusion, as our musicians please come. So what's the point? Number one, believe in his creative power. Do I get an amen? amen? Believe in his creative power that God spoke and it took place. I'll give you a few examples in the word of God. Psalms 33 verse 9. For he spoke and it came to be. He commended and it stood firm. The idea is immediately it took place. You don't need millions of years in order for God, for God said, let there be light or for God to say, um, to create the green grass and all this stuff. So it's going to take millions and millions of years. This stuff, he spoke it and it was like in 20, by the end of the 24 hour period, it was a done deal. So he spoke and it came to be. There's no time lapse there. He commanded and it stood firm. That's the idea. Psalms 33, verse 6, by the word of the Lord, the heavens were made. Their starry hosts by the what? By the what? The breath of his mouth. He spoke it. That's how powerful your God is. He speaks it, and it takes place. That's amazing. That's awesome. So why is it important that we believe that God spoke things into existence, that he did it with those six real days? Why? Because the gospel hinges on this fact. Listen to this. For what we preach is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, and ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine into our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. In other words, as instant as God spoke and it happened is how instantly you were saved when you accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. Did it take you millions of years to accept Christ? None of us will ever get saved. He spoke it into existence, and he says, this is what he's saying here. For God who said, let there be light, made his light shine into our hearts. In other words, just as God said, let there be light, is how God turned on the lights for you when you accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. Can we put our hands together and thank the Lord? You've experienced the creative power of God because you accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. The power of God to remove you from darkness to light, to change you from the inside out. The same power, the same God, he did the same thing. So you have to believe in his creative power. Secondly, Elohim means to pray this name as you start your prayers. Most people use Elohim, the concept of Elohim, in the beginning of their prayers as I studied the people who pray in the Bible. They use Elohim in their prayers. You have to start using Elohim in your prayers. You know what that means? Coming to God and saying, God, I come to you, the God of heaven, 
That means the one who came down to earth and created. The God of heaven who has the power. And this is what they'll say. The one who created heaven and earth. And then they start their prayers that way. And then they go later on into the prayers about what they need from God. And their personal issues. And the problems that they're faced with. But they don't come right to God and say, God help me right now. Because when you go to God and you say, God help me. And you don't address him and put him in his rightful place. The problem's still bigger than God. But when you come to God and say, oh God, creator of heaven and earth, the one who speaks things into existence, if you spoke things into existence and you created something out of nothing, surely you can help this guy with his situation. Surely you can help my sister with what they're going through. Because the God that we serve is far greater outside of time, can reach into time to help you in the situation that you're going through. That's what it means that he is Elohim. He is the almighty creator. He is the one who created heavens and earth. Let's look at some examples as we close. And God said, Lord, the God of Israel, there is no God like you in heaven above or on earth below. Can you read the rest with me? You who keep your covenant of love with your servants, who continue wholeheartedly in your way. There is no one in heaven above or on earth below. There's nobody like you. Your name is hallowed. Remember how Jesus Christ said to pray? Hallowed be your name. Set apart. His different. In your house, you can probably understand this, especially for those of you who are, are, are a bit older than the younger generation because there was a time period when you would have a wedding and then there would be some special uh, usually people would purchase special dishes. What's the point of it? I don't know. Because the special dishes hardly ever get used. They're stuck in a cabinet somewhere, right? So there's profane dishes. Profane dishes are the dirty dishes that can be in your sink or in your dishwasher. Profane. They're used. They're dirty. We have those. And then there is other dishes as well that you have in your cabinet that you use all the time. Those are common dishes. They're common, right? And then there's the sacred dishes that have their own room, their own cabinet, their own glass cabinet that never gets open. And the dishes just sit there. I'm talking nice, fine looking China stuff that if you put in your microwave, it'll pop all over the place because there's so much metal in it. And so you have those dishes that you don't use anymore, but they're the sacred dishes. When God says, hello, it is your name, it means set apart, sacred for special use. But let me tell you something about God. God, you can, you can call him anytime. He's always being used. And so, and God said, he's the Lord of heaven and earth. There's no one like him. He's set apart. But look at this one. Let's read it together. Are you ready? You alone are the Lord. You made the skies and the heavens and all the stars. You made the earth and the seas and everything in them. You preserved them all. And all the angels of heaven worship you. This is Nehemiah as he begins his prayer, as he's calling on God. Nehemiah's in a tough spot. He's got to go and rebuild the wall of Jerusalem. When he comes to God based on his problem, you know what he says? Oh God, you made the skies and the heavens and the stars. He has to remind himself as he prays to God that God, if you can do all of this stuff, surely you can take care of me. And my situation and the situation with Jerusalem and rebuild these walls. Let's look at another example in Isaiah. Isaiah, let's read it together. Are you ready? Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, enthroned between the cherubim. You alone are God over all the kingdoms of the earth. You have made heaven and earth. Again, you did what? You made heavens and earth. God, you are the one who created these things. If you can take care of all this stuff, surely you can take care of me. Let's do one more. Jeremiah 32, verse 7. It says, Ah, sovereign Lord, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and outstretched arm. I like this last part. Are you ready? Nothing is too hard for you. Come on, let's put our hands together and praise the Lord. <laughs> Nothing is too hard for you. That's the point of using Elohim. Elohim means that this is the name that you use at the beginning of your prayers in order to help you to realize that God is the ultimate creator. And if he spoke things into existence, he can handle your problems. He can handle your situation. He can handle your situation at work. He can handle your situation with your family. He can handle the situation in your own personal life and the unresolved issues that you may have because he is 
Elohim, all-powerful creator who speaks things into existence. So God, if you did it before and you're sustaining the world, surely you can help me out. Surely you can come and deliver me. Surely you can help me with my situation because God's faithful to bring you to a place in your life where you have to call on him as Elohim. Because the world's broken. Have you realized that? The world's so messed up that we need Elohim in our lives. We need him to be the one who's the all mighty creator the strong mighty creator is who you serve so this is something we can apply right away application this is it believe in his creative power secondly use elohim in the beginning of your prayers it's in the beginning of the bible so that you can address the introductory name of God at the beginning of your prayers to say that he is Elohim. Let's pray together. Father, we want to thank you today. We want to thank you for the power that's in the word of God. And we want to thank you for this new series on which name do you need today? And this is one of those names that we need every day that when we pray to you as Jesus, you taught us hallow or set apart as your name or Father in heaven, it's a reminder that you are the one that's in above us, that you created us, that you have a plan for our lives, that you're going to do great and mighty things for your honor, for your glory. So whatever it is that each of us are faced with today, help us to start off our prayers with you, God, a creator of heaven and earth. That's saying, God, you are Elohim, the mighty creator the one who created everything that we see. So, Father, I pray, God, that you would help us, Lord, to do the things that you've called us to do. God, help us to realize that we are created in the image of God today, in the image of the Lord. I have a question as our eyes are closed for this week. For those of you that are here today, you say, by God's grace, God, I need you to remind me, by God's grace, help me to realize that you are the one who created everything. But help me, Lord, to begin my prayers by saying, God, you are creator of heaven and earth. Even if you're saying your grace around your table, oh God, creator of heaven and earth. Because that's going to set the tune for who God is and what he can still do. If you say, by God's grace, that's what I'm going to do to apply the word this week, is use Elohim, use this God as creator in the beginning of my prayers, then just stand up wherever you are. Yes, just stand up wherever you are. I'm going to pray for you. Father, for each person that's standing today, I pray, Lord, that you would give them the unction of your grace, Lord, to pray, Elohim, O oh God, creator of heaven and earth, O oh Lord, there's no one like you. Help us to apply the word of the Lord today, God, as we understand more of who you are, to glorify you and to lift up your name. And we're thanking you, Jesus, for all that you have in store for us. Help us to live it out in our everyday life, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand together. There's a simple chorus that we're going to sing before we leave today and then we're going to close in prayer and be dismissed all at the same time but let's do that right now it's a simple chorus you will catch on to it simple chorus come on let's sing it now that you got it
Father, we're excited today to practice this word, Elohim, your name. God, thank you that you are mighty creator. Father, I we pray, God, that we would exalt you rather than exalt in our issues and our problems. Help us to put you in your rightful place so everything else falls in its place. So, God, we thank you, Lord. We want to thank you for the uncertainty in this world because it helps us not to put our trust in it, but to put our faith and our trust in you. So, God, bless each person in the building. Bless their households. God, I pray a blessing upon them. I ask that in the name of Jesus, God, that you prosper them, that you protect them, and, God, that you use them for your honor and for your glory. Thank you, God, for the blessings that you are going to pour out in their lives. God, help each person to glorify you and to lift up your name. Thank you, Lord, that you are great. Thank you that you are the mighty creator. Thank you that you have no pajamas, Lord, you never sleep. Help us to glorify you and to lift you up in your rightful place. In Jesus' name we ask, amen. Can we put our hands together and praise God for all that it's going to do this week? Amen. Find some people around you and encourage them right now. Give them the blessing that's needed. Amen. God bless you. Good morning. We're now going to have online giving. We thank God for those of you who have given thus far to our church. And uh, we're going to pray today that whatever you give online, that God will use that to the building up of the church. And so let us pray. Dear God, in the name of Jesus Christ today, we just thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you, oh God, for everything that you have supplied for us. And so, God, in the name of Jesus Christ, even as we give today, I ask in the name of Jesus that it will be used to the building up of your kingdom in the mighty name of Jesus. I pray that even as we give, oh God, that you will continue to supply for us our every need, that whatever we ask for in the name of Jesus Christ, it will be done. And so today, once again, we give you thanks. Because as you supply for us, O oh God, we're able to give unto your kingdom. I pray, O oh God, that you'll bless every hand that gives today in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. And we thank you once again because you are God. Amen and amen. Thank you for being part of an awesome service. I hope you've enjoyed our time with us this week. We look forward to what God is going to do with us next week. Stay tuned to Grace Point. Look out for the notices. We're so awed by and thankful for your presence, and we look forward to what He's going to continue to do in and through your lives. Thank you so much for being a part of Grace Point 